Although I did find out that Travis Klein, who had the uh, Green Bay Packers jersey on, uh, he told Andy that he wore that just to spite me uh, as a Vikings fan. And he said, now, now Pastor Brian has to watch that for the next five weeks every Sunday. <laughs> so I told him that I'm going to steal his cat and shave Vikings on the side. And so he's a little nervous right now. I'm really excited for this new series. We're going to be spending time in Matthew 28, um, the last, very, very last part of the gospel, uh, verses 16 through 20, uh, over the next five weeks. And uh, I think that this is just going to be a, a, a really challenging and, and hopefully compelling and inspiring series as we live in, in the light of Easter. Um, we already heard the scripture uh, just a moment ago in the bumper, so I want to just lead us in a prayer, and then we're going we're gonna to jump right into it. Jesus, thank you that you are the risen one. For you are not in the tomb. You have been raised just as you said, and you are the one who continues to come and meet with us. And we pray that that would happen this morning, that we would encounter you in this time together, in this place, as the living one. The living one who can heal us and make us new, the living one who calls us into a life and into a mission that is so much greater than ourselves alone. So open our hearts, our minds. Lord, help us to hear you, help us to see you. We pray that you would move us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Well, one of my favorite book series of all times is the, the classic um, children's series, The Chronicles of Narnia, by C.S. Lewis. Uh, some of you wrote, re, uh, have read those as kids. Maybe, maybe you read, have uh, been reading them to your own kids or your grandkids. Uh, I, I think that my favorite book in the series, though, is, is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, just continues to be the one that I love the most. And if you're familiar with that story, uh, it, tells, it tells the story uh, of four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And there's a video, there's a movie version. So uh, four children who are sent to the English countryside uh, to live with Professor Diggory Kirk during World War II. And the professor has this huge house, and they're exploring the house, and they come across an old wardrobe, and as they stumble through the wardrobe, they find themselves transported into this magical world call, uh, called Narnia. But when they arrive in Narnia, as magical as it is, they, they learn soon enough that, that Narnia is under a curse. All is not well in the land of Narnia. It's under the curse of the wicked white witch, who makes it always winter and never Christmas, I mean, doesn't that just say it all? I felt that way yesterday when I saw the snow. And the children are fortunate enough um, to meet Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, two animals, friendly creatures, who are, who are no allies to the White Witch. Now, in the magical land of Narnia, uh, all animals can talk. And so there's this scene in the book that I want to share with you uh, in which, like in the, uh, the, the, the picture up here, um, the children are gathered with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and here's the conversation that they have. Mr. Beaver says to them, Are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve? We're some of them, Peter says. Shh, said the beaver. Not so loud, please. We're not safe, not even here. Here the beaver's voice sank, Lewis wrote into silence, and it gave one or two mysterious nods. Then, signaling to the children to stand as close around it as they possibly could, so that their faces were actually tickled by its whiskers, it added in a low whisper, they say Aslan is on the move, that perhaps he's already landed. And now a curious thing happened, writes Lewis. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do, but, but in the moment that the beaver had spoken these words, everything felt quite different. At the name of Aslan, each of the children felt something jump inside of them. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some de delightful stream of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it's the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. They say Aslan is on the move. I love that line. That the quiet rumor starting to rumble throughout the frozen land of Narnia is that the great lion Aslan, the true king, 
of Narnia is moving in such a way that he's about to reclaim his kingdom and to set all things right, to make all things new. The world of Narnia is about to change. And, and, and at the sheer announcement of this news, at the mere mention of Aslan's name, something jumps inside these children. Something comes alive in them. And I can't help but wonder if something like that happened on the very first Easter when Matthew tells us that the two women showed up at the tomb and found it empty. The stone rolled away, the angel seated upon it, and, and the angel gives this shocking announcement, says, you're, you're looking for Jesus, but he is not here. He has risen, just as he said. I wonder if something, if the sheer announcement of that good news came alive in them, something came awake in them. And then the angel sends them, go quickly, Tell the disciples that he is risen just as he said, that he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. So the women go running out of the cemetery. On their way to find the disciples, they encounter the risen Jesus themselves. They fall and they worship him. Matthew gives us this little episode then of the religious leaders trying to pay off um, the guards at the tomb and to get them to, to lie that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. Remember that they were, they were concerned about that. And then Matthew closes his gospel with this scene, up on the mountain. Now last Sunday, uh, if you were with us, I want to hit a really important point I made. Uh, if you weren't with us, let me, let me just kind of emphasize it this morning, is that the good news of Easter, um, it's, it's not just about Jesus dying for our sins and being raised again so that we could be forgiven and put in a right relationship with God and so that we can have the assurance of eternal life when we die. That's part of the gospel, but it's not the full gospel. The surprising news of Easter, what, what makes it so shocking and world-altering, is that God's new creation in the risen Christ is breaking in. The kingdom of God is here now. God is, at, God is on the move. Jesus is on the move. He is not in the tomb. It couldn't hold him down. Death could not stop him. The powers of darkness could not overcome him. He is the risen one. And so Matthew ends his gospel, uh, which is really the beginning, not, not with the disciples just kind of encountering Jesus and, and, and finding themselves kind of renewed with hope, but it, it ends with this great commission, with, with Jesus now giving them an assignment, a task, inviting them into a mission that is so much bigger than themselves. So over the next five weeks, we're going to explore this great commission together, and we're going to reflect together on what it means for us to live as those who have been called and sent by the living Jesus to be on the move with him, to go where he goes, and that as we go, to make disciples. So this morning, I want to um, really point out three, three key movements that are happening in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission, and I want these three movements to really frame uh, the next five weeks as we consider uh, this, this great commission. Here, here they are. Here's the three movements that I want you to notice in the story. First, Jesus moves toward his disciples. That's where it begins. He moves toward his disciples. Then Jesus moves in them so that he might ultimately move through them out into the world. Those three, three uh, prepositions, toward, in, and through, and this morning, I want to I focus on those first two. Jesus moves towards his disciples. He moves in his disciples. And over the next four weeks, then, after coming out of today, we'll focus more on, on the moving through them, although I'll kind of hint at that, say something about that at the end of the sermon this morning. So let's, let's begin, then, with this first movement, that Jesus moves toward his disciples. So after hearing the report from the women that Jesus was alive... Matthew tells us this. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, to the mountain in Galilee. This could be the same mountain where he preached his sermon on the mount to them. Uh, this could be the same mountain where he had taught them what it means to be a disciple, to have the heart and character of a disciple. Jesus, is, it's not by chance that he's telling them to go back to that mountain. He's intentionally calling them back to this mountain. And when they come to the mountain, Matthew tells us that when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. When they saw him, some fell at his feet, and they worshipped him as the living God, which is really quite remarkable. It's a remarkable response, given that the disciples were good, devout Jews who were radical monotheists, which meant that, that they worshipped only one God, and to worship anything else or anyone else even alongside that one God would have made them guilty of breaking the, the commandments, would have made them guilty of idolatry. And yet this is one of the things that Matthew wants us to see. He's wanted us to see it throughout the entire gospel, but here at the end, he wants to just be so clear about this. When we see the disciples worship Jesus, it reveals that Jesus is the, the one true king. He is the one true God who has come to be with us. Some worship him, but some doubted. I love that Matthew includes this line in the story. It could also be translated that some were hesitant. Which ones, I wonder, doubted? Why did they doubt? Did they doubt that it really was Jesus? Or were they hesitant to bow down, uh, perhaps because, like I said, they were such fierce monotheists that they, they knew that they weren't supposed to worship uh, anyone but, 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 but the one true God alone, and they, they just weren't exactly sure about what all of this meant? Or was it that some, uh, or was it not just that some doubted and some worship, but I wonder if we could even move it to this point. Um, I wonder if Matthew maybe even invites us to reflect on uh, that, that, that in each of, each of our hearts, we experience both belief and doubt. That somehow these two things, belief and doubt, can be present at the same time, as if to say that you can still worship Jesus and also have doubt. As if to say that faith isn't the absence of doubt, nor is doubt the cancellation of faith. I think too often we make doubt the enemy of faith. The, the enemy of faith is fear, not doubt. I think doubt is natural. Um, and there are some of us, maybe, who experience even more doubt than others. I love the way that Frederick Beekner puts it. He says that, that, that doubts are the ants in the pants of faith, that they keep it awake and moving. I think what I want to say to you is that if, if you're somebody who experiences doubt, um, that, that, uh, that that's, that's okay. I think all of us find ourselves, I know I do, at times saying, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, that somehow we see, and that's what I think Matthew shows us, even in the disciples who were with Jesus for three years, and they encountered his bodily resurrection. In that moment, some of them worshiped, but others of them doubted and were skeptical. One of the most important things, though, that we see in this, this part of the story is that for both those who worshiped him and those who doubted, what does Jesus do? He moves towards them. It's a, it's a small detail, but it's so important. Don't overlook it. He moves towards them. In the Greek, uh, it can be translated as Jesus stepped forward to them. Not away from them. He stepped forward to them, not just to those whose hearts suddenly were full of faith, but he even moves towards those who found their hearts filled with doubt. I mean, one of the most important things that we learn in this part of the story is that Jesus is always the one who makes the first move. And I want to say to you this morning, no matter where you are in your faith or in your doubts, that the risen Jesus wants to move towards you. Jesus meets us where we are, not where we think we should be. He meets us as we are, not as we think we should be. He meets us in our faith and our doubt alike he meets us in our failure. He meets us in our brokenness. He meets us in our imperfection. I mean, notice the number, by the way, of the disciples. It's 11, Matthew points out. And Matthew is saying something here. 12 signified completeness. 12, the 12 disciples represented the 12 tribes of Israel. It would come to represent the church in the New Testament. And, and Matthew points out that, that there were 11 because Judas Iscariot was not with them indicating that they're, they're coming in their own sense of failure and brokenness and incompletion, and Jesus still moves towards them. And he does the same thing for us today. He moves towards his disciples, though, in order to move in them. And that's the next key movement that I want you to see in the story. 
He moves towards them in order to move in them by the power of the Spirit, and he does that by revealing himself to them. He doesn't just show up kind of alive among them, but but he needs to help them understand exactly what all of this means, his death and his resurrection. Jesus came to them, and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Such an important statement. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Remember, they were confused about the crucifixion. That was not the way that that they expected the story to go. And they were puzzled by the resurrection. What does all of this mean? And Jesus helps them understand, here's what it means. That the cross looked like defeat, but in the resurrection, it's victory. And that Jesus really is the one true king of heaven and earth, and that all authority... In the Greek, it talks about all authorization, all power has been given to him in heaven and earth. Think about that. All authority has been given to him. It points to his identity. Matthew makes it all clear that he is the the king of this upside-down kingdom, that he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, as the prophet Isaiah said so long ago, the one who shall reign forever in all of the governments shall be upon his shoulders. I mean, the disciples were right to to fall down and to worship him. That was the right response because Matthew confirms at the end of his gospel what he says in the beginning, that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the risen and reigning Lord. All authority, all power has been given to him in heaven. Think about that. In the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm. I mean, this is what John would testify to when he was exiled on the island of Patmos uh, during a time when he wrote his seven letters to the, to the, to the churches as they struggled uh, beneath the, 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 the oppression of the Roman Empire. And, and John is swept up in the spirit and he's given a vision. It's like the veil is pulled back into the midst of really painful circumstances. He sees the truest reality and here's what he sees. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. All authority has been given to Jesus in the heavenly realm. Amen? Boy, that was, that was really weak. Like all authority... Amen? Amen. And not just among the angels and the heavenly hosts, but among the principalities and powers of darkness. The Apostle Paul writes on this so powerfully in Ephesians. Uh, This is an important point for Paul, and he's saying that this is what the resurrection means. This is what the authority and power of Jesus means, is that this same power, he says, is, is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And then Paul says this, and God placed him, or excuse me, placed all things, not some things, say it with me, all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. What Paul is saying there is that even the principalities and powers in the cross and resurrection have already been defeated. They've been rendered as a footstool beneath the feet of this risen and reigning king. And here's what's so important about this. Here's the implication. Jesus reigns as king in heaven and on earth this is, not just, this is not just a promise of what's about to happen or will one day happen. It's already true. He already reigns. This cosmic struggle between the powers of good and evil, it, it's, it's not hanging in the balance as if someday we're gonna, you know, we're gonna find the outcome of it. The challenges that we face in our life, it's not kind of left open-ended like will we be able to overcome these things? The resurrection means that Christ has already defeated them. He is already victorious. And what would it look for you to live your life in the light of that reality? I think one thing it would mean is that we would not be driven by fear. 
but we would find ourselves living more courageously knowing that our lives have been claimed by this risen and reigning king, that we're not our own, but we belong to him. But maybe you'll say, but Brian, if that's true, if Jesus already reigns as king, if his kingdom is already breaking in, then how come there's still so much pain and brokenness in the world? It doesn't always look that way. It doesn't always feel like Jesus is king. And here's what's true. Is that while the kingdom is, is here and it's breaking in, what is also true is that it has not come in its completion. The Apostle Paul talks about something that's called the already and the not yet, that the kingdom has already come. And yes, it's, it's here, but it's not yet here in its completion in the sense that, that, that God will come when Christ returns and it's in that day that he'll set all things right and make all things new. Here's, here's an analogy that may be helpful. There's a theologian named Oscar Coleman, and I found this to be super helpful for me over the years, where he, he talks about it like this. He says, think about the, think about the, the death and resurrection and, and return of Christ in this way. On June 6, 1944, the Allies landed on the beaches of Normandy during World War II, and they stormed the beaches, and, and in that moment, the Allies broke, uh, broke Hitler's Atlantic Wall, and, and what do we call that, that day? D-Day, right? And historians agree that, that on that day, June 6, 1944, on D-Day, that the outcome of the war had been determined. It was over. But what we know is that the battle continued on for another 11 months. The fighting continued, and it wasn't until May 7, 1945, that V-Day, Victory Day, came, when all the fighting finally ceased. What Coleman says is that this is a lot like what Jesus has done in the death and resurrection and, and what will happen with his return. That it, 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 even though the battle continued and the fighting continued uh, for 11 months, we know that the outcome of the war was decided on D-Day, June 6, 1944. And what we know, what, what, what the hope of Easter is all about is that in Jesus' death and resurrection, that D-Day has happened, that victory has been secured, and we may find ourselves living in a world where the fighting continues, and V-Day is yet to come when Christ returns, but we live as those who live in the light of Christ's victory already. All authority, Jesus says, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. As we wait then for V-Day to come, here's what's so important is that we don't kind of just sit back and wait, but God in the risen Christ moves towards us and moves in us in order that ultimately now, by the power of his spirit, he might move through us. As we wait for the kingdom to come in its completion, Jesus invites us, draws us in, commands us to be a part of the work that he is doing in the world to bring his kingdom. That's the final movement, and this is where I want to land this morning because it's going to set us up then as we head into the remaining uh, sermons in this series, is that Jesus chooses by the power of his spirit, his resurrection power given to us, he chooses to work through us, his disciples, his church. It's because he is king it's because he has been given all authority in heaven and earth that he then commissions us, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And know that I am gonna be with you always, Jesus says. We're gonna explore each of these pieces over the next four weeks. What does it mean to make disciples? We'll talk about that next Sunday. What about baptism? What does it mean to baptize? We'll talk about that in two weeks. What does it mean to teach all that Christ has commanded us? And what does it mean for us to trust Jesus' assurance that he is with us? But I want to end with this practical question this morning. As Jesus moves towards us, as Jesus moves in us, and not just us personally, but in us together as a church, how is he now calling us then to look out into the world and how does he want to move through us? And my question for you to consider this morning is, is, is where does Jesus want to move you? Where does he want to move through you? 
Ultimately, this kingdom movement is going to spread. Uh, it, it goes to all the nations, right? I mean, that's the scope of the mission. It, it, it ripples to the ends of the earth, but where does it begin? It begins right here. It begins right now. It begins with you and with me. It begins where we already are. I love this detail in Matthew's resurrection story that when, when the disciples are told to go, where, do they, where are they called to go? They're called to go back to Galilee. Galilee, this Galilee is this little town. It's not the big city, it's this little town. It's, it's the place where it all started. Galilee is this little town where they, where they had lived and where they had worked. It's where their families were. It's where their homes were. I think Jesus is saying, I'm on, I'm on the move, and where I'm beginning is I'm, I'm beginning in, in, in your ordinary life, in all of the places where you live, and where you work, and where you play. Your mission field, your mission context is the, place, the places and the relationships where you spend most of your time each day. Where is that for you? Where you spend the, most of your time most of your relationships each day. If you were to make a list, think about that. I think of my marriage. I think of parenting my daughters. I think of Fairway Court over in Alton, my neighborhood. I think of the church here, the staff. I think of you, the congregation. I think of Town Square, where I probably spend too much time. I think of Northwestern College's campus sometimes on Dort's campus, where do you spend most of your time? That's, that's where Jesus is already moving, and that's where he wants you to move with him. This is where it begins. Friends, the good news of Easter is the tomb is empty, that Jesus is not there, that he is on the move, and he will not stop until he brings this kingdom to its completion. In the words of another pastor then, I love this, we're not waiting for the move of God. In the power of the risen Christ, we are the move of God. You are the move of God. We can't stay on the mountain. Jesus never intended it. We gotta go. We gotta go. If we're gonna move with Jesus, we gotta go. So church, are you ready to move? Are you ready to move? Are you ready to move? Father, we pray that you would stir us this morning, that you would begin by moving towards us and moving in us today, and that by the power of your Spirit, Lord, stir us up. Stir us up. Lord, help us to um, begin to see this, this work that you're doing all around us and move us beyond our places of comfort, move us beyond safety and convenience. Lord, move us into this adventure called mission. Let us see where you're working, and Lord, show us how we can join you so that we can be part of what you're doing. Oh Lord, we ask all of this in the power of your spirit, knowing that ultimately we want to move with you for your glory and for the sake of this world that you so love. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, I want to invite you to stand with me as you receive the uh, benediction today. And as we go, just a reminder, um, if you want to catch the preview sessions for the congregational meeting, uh, you can do that in room two. Uh, Bob mentioned that we'll be um, voting next week during services for new elders and deacons and also for the budget. Um, I'm not sure he said this, but let me just remind you that we're going to do our congregational meeting after the third service, right at noon. It'll be a short meeting. We'll, we'll be done in 30 minutes. I promise. Um, so if you can join us for that, it'll be an important time together. We'll receive this, this benediction, which is really a commissioning. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go. And as you go, make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have taught you, and know that I am with you. I am with you always. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen.